Um, we are joined today by great speaker profiles. We have Nicholas Hahn, uh, Philip Lambert, and uh, Jeff Tharp with us. Um, starting with Nick, uh, the next slide, please. Oh, yep, just, just on this one. So Nick is a multidisciplinary engineer with over 20 years of experience developing innovative solutions to complex national security problems. Nick has designed, analyzed, integrated, and tested mission-specific mechanical, electromechanical, and RF systems as large as a nuclear submarine and as small as a key fob. Um, at, uh, so he's coming from a company, uh, the name of the company is Commonwealth Technology Innovation LLC. Uh, since 2005, he was the chief engineer for a deployable sensor program until recently, he's focused on developing CTI's technology roadmap to leverage the resources available for their acquisition by Huntington Ingalls Industries last year. Um, our next speaker comes from Fortify, uh, Phil. Uh, Phil is a mechanical engineer with nearly 10 years of professional 3D printing experience. Phil helps his customers adopt 3D printing as a true, true manufacturing resource. Uh, Phil spent his graduate program in the Dreams Lab at Virginia Tech working on developing novel projection stereolithography systems and has gained broad experience in both design and manufacturing of 3D printed goods across a variety of industries. He is extremely passionate about his contributions towards realizing the goal of market-ready 3D printed products. Our next speaker from ANSYS is Jeff Tharp. Uh, Jeff Tharp has been with ANSYS for over 12 years and is a principal application engineer for RF and digital applications utilizing the ANSYS electronics solutions. Um, I request everyone just enjoy today's event. Uh, it's a very unique webinar uh, for even the audience who's familiar with ANSYS and uh, HFSS. Some slides are graphic intense and may take some time to advance depending on the speed of your connection. Uh, at this time, I'll turn the event over to Jeff. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. So for today, we're going to be looking at, at a pretty nice, dense presentation, but the material that we get to walk away from is just incredibly interesting to see simulation and industry really come together and to see a full workflow like this. You don't normally get this kind of perspective, so we certainly appreciate the partners working with us today. Starting with uh, the ANSYS side, we'll be talking about why 3D printing for RF applications. We'll briefly kind of delve into why this is turning into such a, a keystone for new technologies and the reduction of real estate. From there, we're going to transition really to, you know, 3D printing sounds great, but you got to build it. And how do you go into understanding the processes? And with that, we work with Phil Lambert at Fortify, and he's going to discuss with us the additive manufacturing for these GRIN objects or these graded index components. And then I'll also talk about the characterization and the high-end materials that they utilize and how they understand those properties. Once we've kind of got the foundation and the understanding of these complex geometries in their manufacture, we'll be transitioning to the utilization of those geometries with those materials. And we'll see how Nick Hahn puts together these properties into a design and comes up with these novel designs for the structure we'll be looking at today specifically which is with Lundberg lenses and he'll actually once he starts overviewing the discussion of HFSS we'll transition into a case study which is incredibly interesting where we see all of this culminate so we're looking at the simulation the process of manufacturing the design coming together to a final product and we'll be looking at the performance and it's, it's going to be incredibly exciting and after that we certainly will conclude with some final statements as to uh, on ANSYS' side and then move on to Q&A. So really excited to have you here and look forward to it. Let's uh, go ahead and start. Next slide, please. So one of the first questions we ask ourselves is, is why does 3D printing sound so appealing for RF? And the answer is really simple. It gives the design engineer all the degrees of freedom they've ever wanted, right? So you are able to construct artificial materials. One of the things you've always just wanted to pick a number and use it with uh, the material character the material manufacturing processes with 3d printing this becomes realizable via geometric volume fractioning another is the arbitrary metallic shapes so that you can actually integrate multi-function parts into a single part why is that important a lot of times in rf systems reduction of real estate becomes a prime concern and this ability to integrate everything into a single part becomes important because geometric complexity becomes quote unquote free. 
So for example, rather than have, say, a filter, an ortho mode transducer, and a horn bought from different manufacturers and bolted together serially to combine the functionality, what if I could just use a single topologically optimized structure? That will be the future. It's already starting. Now, when we look at topological optimization, where fundamentally what that means is I'm arbitrarily changing geometry, kind of like on the right-hand side of my screen. Arbitrary changes to geometry, not just length, width, et cetera, but arbitrary changes using complex optimization routines. You can start doing multi-physics and multiple physics simulations to consider weight, thermal properties, but also material property control. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges? And, and when it comes to simulation, a lot of the challenges is how do I include all of this complex geometry into my model? How do I bring this advanced CAD in? And this is where you're looking at interesting material properties that are starting to be displayed, including dispersive conducting models. In the future, you're starting to see a lot of terahertz. When you get into the terahertz domain, metals become dispersive. And that can play a little bit of havoc on the performance, particularly on the loss side. But you're also dealing with dispersive dielectrics. The good news is the counter is that you could optimally design these to do that. And you can utilize simulation technology such as HFSS to take the micro, a very small unit cell, and apply it to the macro, which we'll actually see today with respect to the RCS of the, of the Lundberg lens. Very exciting. But also when you're looking at the challenges, that's being able to include spatially varying material properties. What if the person who printed via 3D printing has a cloud file? that has effective materials for each point in space, and I can bring the cloud file in and just map permittivity and conductivity all throughout my, design, my domain. That's a huge advantage. If we look at the top right of the screen, that's fundamentally what we've done. You take a computational fluid dynamics simulation of a hypersonic craft going about Mach 10 at about 48 kilometers above the Earth, and you take the temperature, the electron density, and all the necessary information, and you create a permittivity map around this structure, and you start doing electromagnetic analysis. So when we look at all these, we have the ability to solve very high-end complex geometries so that we can enable geometric simplicity, but preserve electromagnetic complexity for advanced design. But now, simulating complex materials is very important, but at the end of the day, when the rubber meets the road, things need to be built and things need to be processed. And to that end, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Phil from Fortify to really start learning more about how, how do we physically realize some of these novel design concepts that we do through simulation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. That was a wonderful introduction to the challenges we're facing here. Um, and I'm happy to play the role in this workflow. Uh, just as a point of introduction, my name again is Phil Lambert, uh, and I'm the lead customer solutions engineer at Fortify. Um, and thanks, Renak, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I've been working in this industry for 10 years nearly. Uh, and today, what I'm going to um, add to this webinar is, is, just as Jeff said, how we go from design concepts to reality and the workflow that we leverage to get there. And so I'll be talking about Grin devices. I'm going to introduce Radix with, uh, with help from our partners at Rogers Corporation. And I'll discuss the high-level design workflow we're getting from concepts to real parts. And then at the end, I'll discuss about how we actually make uh, the components. All right, let's step into it. So uh, for the company history of Fortify, we are a venture-backed OEM. Uh, we had a, our latest fundraising round in 2021 uh, with our Series B led by Cell Partners. We're located in Boston, Massachusetts, and we make 3D printers and we sell 3D printing material. Our 3D printer, a uh, series of uh, printers that we have available right now is called the Flux series of 3D printers. We have the Flux Core, the Flux One, and the Flux 3D. Um, the difference between these three machines is primarily uh, the number of electromagnets leveraged for fiber alignment, magnetic fiber alignment. Um, it's an interesting technology that I'm not going to discuss today because we're printing pure dielectrics, and pure dielectrics um, by design have no magnetic uh, elements in them. And so we'll, we'll, we will be leveraging the flux core 3D printer uh, primarily, which is this one back here that has no fiber alignment, but does have a series of other benefits that I'll discuss later on. Um, but primarily in this first slide, what I wanted to highlight is that we are a digital light projection based 3D printing technology uh, with a sizable build envelope at eight, eight inches by four and a half inches by 13 inches uh, with a pixel pitch of 75 microns. 
So we can make pretty large stuff at a pretty fine scale. And we leverage this technology uh, to make 3D printed grin devices. So at a high level, uh, as I'm sure a lot of the experts who use HFSS on a regular basis are aware, grin devices are gradient uh, refractive index devices, and they're electromagnetic structures with continuously spatially graded indices of refraction. So if you look at this um, picture on the left here, you can see that we have a distribution of permittivities from two at the core of this hemisphere to one at the surface. And what this is actually doing fundamentally is leveraging refraction uh, as we go from one region of permittivity to another, and it bends those, uh, those re uh, electromagnetic waves to focus energy. And in this case of the Lundberg lens, it focuses energy um, coming from one side uh, to a beam on the other. So we can leverage these grin devices, especially this Lundberg lens style device, uh, to design uh, antenna systems with wider bandwidth, increased aperture efficiency, and higher gain on a platform that enables uh, technologies with lower weight and scalable manufacturing, right? This DLP technology for those of you who are familiar with the industry, has been leveraged in multiple applications where, um, where scalable manufacturing has been achieved, and that would be in shoe soles uh, from Adidas or from New Balance, and for dental aligners like those from Invisalign. So it's this technology, this digital light processing technology that has been demonstrated to scale, and so Fortify is bringing that to Grin devices. So I'm going to pass it over to Rogers Corporation. My colleague Trevor Polidor is going to briefly introduce the Rogers Radix 3 printable dielectric material in a short video. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about Rogers' new Radix 3D printable dielectrics technology. The Radix 3D printable dielectric materials provide a scalable solution to manufacturing gradient index and complex dielectric parts, enable our customers to enhance the figure of merits of their RF systems with components that can't be made with traditional fabrication processes. These are things like gradient index lenses or three-dimensional and volumetric circuits um, that can't be used with traditional fabrication techniques. And so what Rogers has done is we've developed a new low-loss UV curable resin system used on DLP 3D printing systems like the Fortify 3D printer shown here to manufacture these dielectric components with a high throughput, high resolution. 3D printing process. And so historically, the reason why Rogers developed this Radix printable dielectric material is that there was a gap in uh, low loss materials for RF components um, with high resolution, high th throughput 3D printing processes. So if we look at historically, a lot of the low loss materials were thermoplastics used for fused filament fabrication 3D printing techniques. And typically there's a trade off with that technique for um, things like throughput, um, feature size, resolution, and surface finish needed for high performance RF components. And so with the introduction of Radix, our first material, a 2.8 dielectric constant uh, 3D printable dielectric resin, um, we're now enabling the advantages of DLP printing, um, the highest resolution, high throughput 3D printing process for low loss dielectric components. Uh, I just wanted to put this slide up here again, just to emphasize uh, how important this innovation is. The Radix material uh, truly breaks the paradigm of this distribution of materials uh, and their um, electromagnetic properties for RF and microwave applications. So with the Rogers material and the Fortify FlexCore 3D printer, uh, we are able to manufacture grid devices. And if you think about what's missing from that workflow, from that slide I just showed on that last image, uh, sorry, on that last slide, uh, is the lens design, right? So we've shown how to make the, the, the parts, or we've shown the, the ingredients to make these lenses. But what's missing from that recipe is the distribution of dielectric uh, uh, definition within that boundary. And so in these, Fortify thinks about this workflow in three steps. RF lens design, which happens at the RF antenna design engineer stage, where they're trying to solve a problem, you know, create uh, create some sort of antenna system uh, combined with a lens to to you know achieve some level of gain or antenna steerability, what have you, within a within a boundary. 
And then from there, Fortify sees the next two steps as the lens geometry definition. So how do we go from this concept to an actual geometry that does what we need the lens to do? And then how do we convert that geometry into a build file? And so these steps two and three are, are the steps that Fortify takes care of. And then after Nick presents, I'll walk you through precisely how we calculate um, this effective media approach and how we apply it to these lens devices. But for now, I'm going to pass it off to Nick Hahn at, at uh, CTI, who's going to discuss how uh, their team designed a lens uh, for their application. So I'm going to pass it over to Nick. He'll take it away. Okay, thanks a lot, Phil. Um, everybody hear me okay? Good to go. Yes, yep, we can hear you. Great. Uh, so what I'll do is um, show you a little bit of what's behind the scenes here when we develop some real responsive mission solutions using these advanced RF and manufacturing tools. And um, it has been really cool to be part of uh, this this idea of becoming a reality as you know your team and Rogers have taken the idea of principal dielectrics and made it real. And you know we're super excited to go. Um, you know, just from some of the even more straightforward systems that we're showing here today to some really complex and, and kind of mission altering, um, mission changing solutions. And uh, also thanks to ANSYS and Fortify, other folks at Fortify and the Rogers teams for, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to get involved here. But first, real quick, since CTI is probably a new name to many of you, I can um, introduce who we are and then pick up where Phil left off. Um, as I uh, mentioned briefly in, in the bio at the beginning, um, CTI is part of HII. Um, some people may know it as Huntington Engels Industries, which is the nation's one of the nation's largest shipbuilders. Um, so two huge shipyards, building both surface and underwater uh, undersea vehicles. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is there's also a Mission Technologies Group, um, which is you know deals with a much wider range of national security solutions um, we have we were uh, part of the alliance science and technology organization which was acquired by hii last year and it's really great to, to be a part of a just you know a really cool company with so much resources that we can develop um, when i started at cti we were kind of an overgrown garage shop and now it's just amazing what we can leverage as part of these larger organizations while still really staying focused on being quick and responsive to our customers' missions. So, uh, yeah, next slide, please. So, yeah, the Mission Technologies Group um, that I just mentioned, um, formerly known as the Technical Services Division, encompasses a whole bunch of different areas. Um, so, from unmanned systems, the, uh, the hydroid Remus vehicles are a big product line, um, to a bunch of other domains, live virtual constructive training, and uh, the C5 ISR, the Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance Group, where CTI is located. And CTI in particular, we are located in Northern Virginia, and our focus is intelligence solutions um, for the uh, intelligence community, Department of Defense, as well as federal law enforcement, and really being quick on our feet and providing solutions to specific missions, um, things that the commercial market isn't necessarily going to support and that large scale um, defense department procurement isn't appropriate for or could take too long. And, you know, we've been doing this for over 50 years, um, really applying tradecraft and engineering talent to build what ne is needed to make really uh, important missions happen for important customers, I like to say. And it's been great working with a, a group of really talented engineers um, and technicians. Um, you know, we've got a great tool set and do a lot of hands on work, but also a fair bit of simulation. And that's what I'll get into next. So we need a concept, we need an idea to take these really neat um, gradient index printable solutions and make them a reality. And when we learned about these, one of the first things that came to mind is um, in collaboration with the electronic warfare and the uh, special forces type communities where you, there is a real need to be able to um, tailor the appearance of 
the radar appearance of uh, any system that is you know out of visual sight. So as a simplified example, you can imagine some drones with radar reflectors uh, that are broadband and low cost enough to be able to uh, respond to multiple different kinds of threat radars and bounce back a signal that is maybe exactly or maybe not exactly what they sent out instead of seeing what's behind the swarm. Um, and you can even do that in combination with other uh, things like an active intelligent um, RF system, for example, on a small unmanned surface vehicle like you see there, um, something that was demonstrated uh, last year at a DOD sponsored event. Uh, so with this concept in mind and the materials in hand, let's go to the next slide and we can see how we started to make this a reality. Um, so we have this mission need, which CTI likes to stay aware of, um, you know, stay really tightly coupled with our customers, trying to figure out what their hard problems are, and also try to stay aware of available technology. What and and do small, um, important pro small. Uh, forward-looking projects to make sure that we have the technology available and we know how to use it when it comes time to to accomplish a, a particular mission. And when that happens, we can quickly generate some concepts. So uh, after the concept, and I'll show you some of the ways that we get into the RF design of a concept shortly, um, we can do, take two paths. And in this, we like to do them quickly because the whole idea is to make these solutions responsive not something that shows up uh, years later after an extended procurement process. So we have a 3D geometry workflow, um, scanning, for example, uh, off the shelf or modified off the shelf, government off the shelf hardware, um, and then building and prototyping the parts that we need to make the mission happen, integrating custom hardware, integrating, um, integrating government supplied hardware, or in this case, integrating a new capability. And so let's look at the last piece of the puzzle here, which is the RF design workflow and figuring out how do we make this idea of a retro reflector um, happen? And can we make it more efficient and light enough and still stay inexpensive enough to uh, deploy them in large groups with small drones without a whole lot of extra engineering effort? So let's dive into that. So at the concept design level, um, there's a number of different ways you can approach it. And for something like an RF lens uh, or really any design, um, it's upfront we wanna identify what are our constraints and our objectives. In the case of this system, um, there's a couple key uh, constraints here like aperture size and the shape available. Um, in this case, we are aware that Lunenburg lens retroreflectors are already out there. The difference is they're usually complex and they, and because they need to have multiple dielectric materials precisely machined. And if you try to make them quickly out of available materials and 3D print them, usually they're too lossy to work at large range. So this was why um, it became a, re a potential reality here with these 3D printable radix materials. Um, the location and the frequency of your RF sources and just the available dielectric constants, uh, when you're talking about dielectric designs, the range of available constants is key here. So for this material, we're talking about something a little more than one, because you need something in addition to the air up to somewhere in the range of two and a half uh, for the radix material, which in, in solid form is about two point. 6, 2.8, I think. Um, and then what we want to do is not dive too deeply into the RF details before we know the basic form factors that are going to work. Um, and RF lenses, sometimes they're put in front of horn antennas, so you'll see a hyperbolic form. The Lunenberg lens here um, is a pretty classic demonstration of, of physical optics. Um, and Ray tracing or refraction calculations are a good way to get the basic shape and the basic starting point dielectric distribution that you need. Um, and in fact, in the, the later versions of HFSS, um, 
you can do the geometric and, and physical optics, not just for metallic um, or and conductive materials, which was is the SBR plus system that's very often used for radar cross section measurement, um, the shooting and bouncing rays. But now you can actually uh, model refractive dielectrics right in HFSS. So if you in the in this case, we had done some optimization work with um, with Rogers ahead of time uh, using MATLAB as a simulation tool to get the basic physical optics laid out. Um, but now that can also be done in HFSS. Um, and the other reason to use the physical optics as a starting point, but not trust them necessarily when you get into the microwave range is we are kind of at the margin of, of those va models being valid because we want this to be a small lightweight lens. And so we're, we're actually ending up with uh, wavelengths that are not too different from the diameter of the part. And anybody who's worked in the radar field knows is that's kind of when things get complicated. So we need to get, generate some candidate design points, which you can do from this workflow and figure out you know, what are the parameters we're going to use and how do we span the design space sparsely so that we don't waste a lot of time, but sufficiently to get uh, a reasonable optimization. And so then we, we transition into a baseline um, RF lens in HFSS and doing a first full wave uh, analysis. And as I mentioned, we <laughs> I, I come from a more of a mechanical simulation background and CFD as well. Um, and transitioning to RF world has been eye-opening for me um, in terms of what the tool sets can do. But this sort of most important, most forgotten rule in simulation, which I'm guilty of uh, violating myself many times, is start simple. Uh, because if you start complicated, then you don't know um, what you don't know, I guess, about the, the complexity and the, the subtleties of the model. So in this case, um, starting with a multi-shell simple model of like has been done for Lunenburg lenses before, um, lets us confirm that the end-to-end -end setup really works before we put the complexity in. And also working from the much more common scenario of a lens that is being fed by an aperture, in this case a waveguide, um, rather than getting into the complexities of the ref retro reflector and potential diffraction effects and things like that, making sure that the whole end-to-end -end workflow is behaving before we add the bells and whistles. So we're able to observe and assess here, see that it is in fact creating a plane wave, even with a relatively simple geometry where we have a dielectric constant of about one and a third, one and two thirds, and then a little over two in the center. Um, and you can see that we're at working around 10 gigahertz, a common radar frequency, and the diameter is about 62 millimeters, which is you know, on the order of just a couple wavelengths or you know, parts of a wavelength. Um, yeah, so you can see that we're not in the 10 or 20x range where you could treat this as a physical optics problem. So the full wave sol solver matters. And it's also pretty quick. I mean, these models run in you know, minutes, not hours or days when you want to get in the ballpark up front. Um, and the last thing I'll say here is, you know, it's really nice to just be able to type in the dielectric constant you want rather than having to look up in a catalog what is available. The 3D printing is a real enabler here. Um, but the key being that it, it's not worth doing necessarily unless you have the low loss material like like we're working with now. Then we go from the baseline model to the reflector model. So we're metallizing one hemisphere. We actually using a 3D printed shell where we had uh, electroplating done on the interface and then that gets bonded to the back of the lens and it becomes a wide angle broadband retro reflector. Um, so on the top right is the reflective part and you can see that the way we excited this in HFSS is using plane wave excitations um, from a number of different angles and then measuring both the monostatic which is the radar bounces back to the same source and the bistatic returns which is uh, if you have a source in one location, but the receiver is in another location. And 
you can see down below um, where we have some monostatic profiles, um, what happens when you vary the minimum and maximum dielectric constants. So the sort of canonical textbook version of the Lunenburg lens, the sphere here, would have a parabolic dielectric profile starting at one at the edge and going up to two in the center. And that is represented by the curve with the dots. And you can see that that's actually not the best design at these frequencies and, and size scales uh, if you want a well-behaved retro reflector. So we parameterize the max and min values of the RCS and you can see how that monostatic return varies. Um, and in particular, there's a range of values where you get a pretty strong but also pretty broad beam um, bouncing back. So that means that the you're not you don't have to be pointing so precisely to get a good reflection back to the source. And in fact, by designing it, we can control how wide that reflection is. Um, and that's a trade-off because you do lose a little efficiency when you want that broad coverage. Um, and the other thing is, again, physical reality has to be you know, carefully monitored here. There is a minimum achievable dielectric constant. We can't go all the way to air. And so we put that in as a constraint here and are able to make sure that we don't uh, entertain anything that's outside of our realistic solution space. Next slide, please. So once we are get in the ballpark of the right parameter values, we can then run the optimization and in, in a reduced design space, use the HFSS um, or any of the plugin alternative uh, optimization schemes. Uh, in this case, a pretty straightforward gradient descent method works well here. Um, we modeled a equa simple equation-based curve, and you can put that right into the material properties in HFSS. And I would say thank you, Jeff, for helping me understand some of the uh, workflow there uh, from the ANSYS side. It's really great to be able to leverage these capabilities uh, right in the tool rather than having to figure it out outside and then program in multiple uh, spatially varying properties. And um, we didn't have to do it in this case, but I understand you can also read those in from a file um, if you have an external um, starting point that you want to use for your spatially varying properties. So we varied two shape factors and then we're also able to tune the gap between the reflect reflector and the lens. and we're able to run a pretty wide space um, of models in only an hour on a decent desktop PC, just my regular CAD machine. Um, and you can see on the left here, um, the contour plot shows the bi-static uh, return. So the monostatic one we were showing on the previous page corresponds to the, the diagonal line in the center where you have um, the azimuth of the return signal and the incident wave the same. Um, but off axis, you get a different return and you can see the strength of that return varies with the angle. And this is for a particular value of maximum and minimum uh, dielectric constant with that parabolic distribution. On the bottom of the screen, you can see um, an export of the different, of the, pr the profile from the optimization solver. And each of those points represents a combination of values that resulted from the uh, exploration of the parameter space. And so you can see it start, started out sort of at a little bit of a lower RCS value and a lower, a larger standard deviation, which means we're sort of got a non-uniform distribution. And what we chose to optimize here was a linear combination of these two values. And you can see how it moved up the curve and eventually found a, an optimum where we got a reasonably strong return, but also a reasonably uniform return across that 30 degree central angle. And next slide, please. And this is what it looks like when you show that kind of return on mounted on the drone to scale. Um, so this is a small lens on a small quadcopter uh, this is a one that is made in the U.S. and is readily available and deployable. And you can see that depending on where the radar beam comes from, you get a 
you still get a pretty good straight back return, but that varies widely. It, that uh, is is a wide central beam, so you don't need a precise location of the um, of the emitter to be able to point accurately to get a good return. Um, once we have the the design space covered, we can repeat our our design point at a higher spatial resolution and do some performance prediction. Um, but we still need to make the part. And that's where we get into exporting our property distribution, either in a continuous fashion or a discrete fashion, and sending it over to Fortify. And again, the nice thing here is we don't need to model those micro scale features. Um, the unit cells, the spatially varying properties that are necessary to create a effective dielectric constant across space are added in their 3D workflow. So I think this is where I will hand it back to Phil and thank you for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions uh, in the chat and we'll, I'll be back at the end. Nick. Yeah, I really appreciate you walking us through that. So after Nick's completed his design workflow and he's got his first design that he wants to 3D print and get into a test range and start evaluating actual behaviors, um, you know, Fortify has the workflow, you know, we, you know, we talked about the first part here with Nick, where we're getting to that lens design, uh, but Fortify has the workflow to convert those dielectric distributions into actual geometry and 3D printable build files. Um, and so at the end of, uh, uh, Nick's design simulation effort, we were left with this design. It's a, it's a Lundberg style lens, not exactly. Um, the continuous gradient distribution defined by the Lundberg style, the Lundberg lens equation on the screen here, but we had six shells um, uh, with a variety of radii up to a radius of 31 millimeters, diameter 30, uh, um, 62 millimeters, with effective primitivities from 1.92 down to 1.17. And so, you know, how do we go from this information to a 3D geometry? We do that leveraging effect effective media. And so there are, there are a series of conditions that our unit cell that we're using um, uh, in, a, in a periodic fashion to create this lens uh, that the unit cell has to meet. Uh, one is that the unit cell needs to be isotropic, and two is that the unit cell needs to be sufficiently sub-wavelength. Uh, in the case of the, of the lens we're describing today, the, uh, the unit cell is five millimeters uh, uh, cubed, which is su sufficiently overkill for the application of t at 10 gigahertz. Uh, but for the, for, the, for the sake of this demonstration, we'll just stick with the five millimeters. And what we're doing here is we are leveraging this reverse clausius mazzotti model to go from effective permittivity at each one of those shells to an effective, to, a, to an actual volume fraction of air relative to that base dielectric material of 2.8 dK. So at 100% solid, it's 2.8. And the example I have down here in this gyroid embodiment is 40% uh, solid will get us to about 1.2. And so the chart on the left you're seeing is the relationship that we've established between effective permittivity on the x-axis and air fraction in the black curve. And so at a given unit cell size, we can vary our wall thickness in our gyroid to get to an air fraction. And so by plotting all these, all these three characteristics on this chart, we have what we actually need, which is a relationship of gyroid wall thickness to effective permittivity at a given unit cell. And so from there, we're able to go to a geometry. So, uh, so long as we're meeting the conditions for air fraction at a region in those six shells, we're able to uh, get to an effective medium that behaves as a, as a solid dielectric at a given dielectric constant. And so we have three examples here, 1.26, 1.59, and 1.92. And as we get higher in effective dielectric constant, effective being the key word here, uh, our volume fraction of material grows, our air fraction shrinks, and through that mixing equation, we're able to get to effective permittivities uh, at the core of 1.92. And so we have our geometric design. So how do we 3D print it? Well, I, we talked about the FlexCore 3D printer earlier. That's the system we use to actually make these components. Um, I just want to re-highlight that it has a pixel pitch of 75 microns. We're currently printing this material at 75 micron layer thicknesses. And the system's also equipped um, with a couple attributes, specifically rugged design, which allows us to 3D print highly filled viscous photopolymers. Uh, and then it also has another uh, tool uh, 
um, a, a module included called CKM, which I'll highlight in just a second. Um, but for those of you who are unaware of 3D printing or how this type of 3D printing process works, uh, we have a reservoir here that's filled uh, with resin. Uh, that's what the yellow represents here. And we have our build plate. Build plate plunges into this resin until it's just uh, one layer thickness above our glass. Uh, and so we have, in this case, 75 microns of uncured resin between the build plate and the glass. Our DLP projector activates to project the cross section for that given layer that we're trying to cure. After that is cured in UV light, uh, we then peel our, and we move the build plate in the positive Z direction to peel that cured uh, layer of resin from the film. And then uh, periodically we'll use a wiper that passes under the cured part and the build plate to keep that glass clean and participate in the mixing of this fiber filled material. And so I mentioned this earlier CKM, that stands for continuous kinetic mixing, which is our onboard tools uh, module for uh, managing the viscosity of these materials and the homogeneity of these materials through circulation and heating of this highly uh, uh, viscous photopolymer. Uh, using these tool sets, we're able to eliminate particle set settling, which helps to preserve consistent RF properties in all axes. So if you were to print this uh, photopolymer on different systems that was not equipped with CKM, you'd run into significant particle sedimentation, which would ultimately alter your dielectric behavior of your material. So combining this capability with the DLP technology that allows us to get those, to those fine features, we're able to print these thin walls and these bulky parts with equivalent consistency and ease, allowing us to make actual lenses. And so what you're seeing here on the left and on the right are images of this specific lens that we're talking about in this uh, application on a build plate printed five at a time in about 10 hours out of the Rogers um, Radix low loss printable dielectric. And so that's how we get to a 3D printed grin lens. I'm gonna pass it really quickly back to Nick who will talk about what's next once he gets the lens. Right, so here's a picture of what it looks like fully integrated. Um, we would then proceed to test. Um, when we get the lenses, um, we bring them into the anechoic chamber and perform uh, radar cross-section testing. And we do that both with and without the vehicle to make sure that our concept level design assumption that we don't need that we don't need to model the vehicle directly uh, for, for the basic performance estimates is accurate. And we can see uh, any other issues that may or have arisen in the manufacturing or integration process. Um, and assuming no issues there, you go to a detailed design model if you have time. A lot of times uh, for the CTI's customers, we don't have time. We need to get it right the first time. And that's why the simulation process and, and having well-characterized materials and a reliable process really is important. Uh, I would say two thirds of our work is prototype to the field. And you know there is a significant por portion of it where sooner or later you are gonna need to have that full design um, confidence and full design disclosure. So we can also analyze the structures in ANSYS Mechanical. We can, it, it happens to be the tool that we use um, we can also do some micro scale validation, um, looking at the unit cells as uh, Phil was talking about before, you can, as you go to higher frequencies and this lens that we chose actually is, is able to work at much higher frequencies. At some point you do start to see some wavelength specific effects and you wanna make sure that you understand those and where your limits are. So you can do the, the full scale validation with the, the gyroid structures right in HFSS if you're, for example, looking at millimeter wave frequencies. And then the fun part, right? Go do some flight testing. Um, and the idea is that these drones will be able to work together as a swarm if necessary, um, you know, small enough, light enough that an individual person could carry more than one. And the ability to make these really high efficiency radar reflector targets, which often you don't see up to until you get to much larger, more expensive systems uh, using this Lunenburg lens geometry is really um, a potential game changer for us, especially if you wanna do things 
even more interesting than just putting a reflector in there. There are active solutions that can also be done with the Lunenburg lens and other lens shapes and RF materials that can be integrated. So uh, this being our prototype, I hope you enjoyed the walk through the workflow. I think Jeff has some comments on you know, how else you can leverage this 3D printing capability to do some, some of these complex RF geometries that are one step beyond what we're demonstrating here. Yeah, thank you so much. So, so this is really cool. And what I want to do is kind of kind of wrap things out with some of the ideas here. What we've learned in, in RF design, whether it's antennas or other RF designs, is that you tend to look at four aspects. You look at the idea, the process engineering or the manufacturing, the design, and the test. So what's really cool here is we've seen two partners reach out because what happened is the fabrication process actually enabled the design. And it's really interesting to see all of these come together and see how Nick is looking forward to going more complex into larger simulations. And really what this is alluding to is using simulation as the virtual environment to realize in advanced manufacturing processes in your, in your designs and seeing if they can be done and taken to where you want them to go without necessarily spending up front to build it. So we're seeing 3D printing and, and RF applications really building a symbiotic relationship here. And, and one of the frank reasons for that is that 3D printing is rapidly disruptively changing the technology we're seeing in RF, both on back end and front end systems. And we're seeing that HFSS is playing a huge role in order for a user to robustly explore the design spaces. And there's certain reasons for this. And simulation is incredibly important, but there are three things you've got to be able to do in simulation to enable these kind of designs to be realized. You've got to be able to mesh geometry. You've got to be able to scale the solvers, and you need to be able to design and optimize in a virtual environment. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. HFS is at the cusp of the meshing. We've been doing it for 30 plus years. It accurately conforms to any curvilinear geometries advanced, whether they're imported, it could be even point cloud. There's a lot of advanced capabilities on the CAD side. The mesh fits the CAD. It's incredibly important. And we refine that mesh based on electromagnetic complexity such that when it's done, you're solving the electromagnetically appropriate mesh without manually getting involved. Next slide. Once we're looking at these solutions, the important aspect of this becomes having solvers that can scale with the physics. And we saw here an excellent example. When Nick was starting with the initial design, the processing that Phil provided was at the very micro scale. And we saw that Fortify had these advanced clausius Masati reverse relationships to extract material properties, but sometimes it's not analytic. So you wanna be able to have a solver that can handle it. At the end of the day though, it needs to be mounted to the drone. And if we keep getting electrically larger in size, we need to have solvers that can handle that in an efficient time manner. Next slide. Once we put all of these together, you need to be able to have an environment to turn knobs, to move things around, to drop things in, pull things out, and to do nice design. And of course, HFSS, along with other ANSYS suite of tools, gives many multiple facets of doing design, and optimization. So when we come to bring all this together, simulation goes hand in hand with these advanced disruptive technologies. Next slide. But at the end of the day, where ANSYS really sits in the forefront, is we, having a, we, we have a conversation today on RF electromagnetics, but you wanna be in a platform, in a home, in a neighborhood that can handle all the physics needs that you see. Whether it's multi-physics, where you're solving individual physics, say a, just a mechanical or just a thermal, or multi, excuse me, coupled physics where they're talking to one another and you're seeing their effects and ANSYS certainly has a huge portfolio. We're looking at just one pillar of this, but if you have any questions or interest, please feel free to ask questions as we go to structural, to thermal, reliability and PCB, also embedded software. But with that, I really want to kind of make a stop here. And first of all, thank Phil and Nick for all the efforts they've done here. It's really neat to see a story come together where you're seeing simulation, meet manufacturing, meet design, um, and just really seeing an application in context. So thank you very much today for your time, both Nick and Phil, and for everyone joining us today.